Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Heritage Foundation webinar, Is the Postal Service Worth Saving? Uh, we have an exciting debate for you today with uh, three experts. But before we get started, um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Romina Boccia. I am the director of the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget here at the Heritage Foundation. I am excited to welcome you to this webinar, and I'm really thrilled that you've taken time out of your day to join us today. And it is my goal to make it worth your time and have you walk away uh, with new knowledge about this important issue that affects all Americans. A few housekeeping items to get us started. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available afterwards on heritage.org forward slash events. Within 48 hours, we will also be sending you an email so you can uh, watch it at a later time if you'd like or share it with others who weren't able to be here today. We encourage you to submit questions throughout this webinar to help us understand what you're most interested in and so we can make this webinar uh, most relevant to you. So please submit your questions in the tab um, throughout the uh, webinar, use the questions tab and we'll be able to see those and uh, pull those up. We'll also have leave some time at the end for more Q&A um, so feel free to keep them coming. Before we get started with our actual panel, I want to see um, what you're already thinking. So I'm going to launch a quick poll here um, that has three questions, and only uh, you as attendees can answer them. And the question is, do you think the United States Postal Service should be privatized, reformed, or bailed out? Our event today is because the United States Postal Service has been running deficits and it has warned that it may go bankrupt. Uh, just today, new financials came out that indicate that its situation may not be as dire as it was initially projected, but we'll have our um, panelists tell us more about that in a little bit. Nevertheless, the Postal Service is asking for a bailout and they also received another line of credit from the US Treasury in order to deal with coronavirus related expenses. But to discuss uh, the future of the Postal Service uh, today, I would like to take a moment to introduce our uh, panelists. And for that, I am going to uh, close the poll. So um, everyone go ahead and turn on your webcams, but keep your um, microphone on mute for now. Um, I'm excited to be joined today by Kevin Kosar, who's Vice President of Research and Partnerships at R Street Institute. He spent a decade with the Congressional Research Service, including writing for Congress about the Postal Service. Um, in his spare time, he, he's a, a prolific uh, fisherman, and he also likes writing about alcohol, including about whiskey and uh, moonshine. I highly recommend uh, his work in that space as well. I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Rachel Gressler. She's a research fellow in economics, budget and entitlements at the Heritage Foundation. She's a labor, pensions and compensation policy expert who's also spent time in Congress working at the Joint Economic Committee. And she frequently testifies before lawmakers and has been a real force of nature in protecting taxpayers from having to bail out uh, the pension plans of uh, private unions, but also governmental pension plans. Uh, she joins us today to talk about the USPS compensation system. And then our third panelist, Chris Edwards. He is the director of tax policy studies at the Cato Institute and also the editor of downsizinggovernment.org. Uh, check that out. It's full of insightful recommendations for ways to right size the federal government and make sure that it's focused on truly national priorities that are constitutional. Uh, Chris uh, was a, a senior economist on a Congressional Joint Economic Committee before joining Cato, a manager with PricewaterhouseCoopers, and an economist uh, with the Tax Foundation. And with that, I'd like to um, dive right in. And I wanna start with you, Kevin, this morning. Um, tell us a little bit, how, do, how did we get here? Why is uh, USPS in such um, financial troubles, how deep are those financial troubles, and uh, yeah, why are they losing so much money? The floor is yours, Kevin. Well, the Postal Service um, faces a problem of annually rising operating costs, driven largely by um, the fact that its labor force, which is 600,000 people, 
uh, is heavily unionized. And on the other side is the decreased demand. Revenues have been flat uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, mail volume has dropped 30%. So here you have a very large unionized, sprawling public enterprise that is supposed to deliver mail to everyone's home six days a week uh, and achieve all sorts of other policy goals, um, but it can't control its costs very well. And the demand for its main service has been flagging. And so, yeah, it's been running structural deficits, and I think it's got somewhere between 130 billion and 150 billion in unfunded debt and obligations. So it's in dire shape, and we need to take action to make sure this uh, enterprise and its problems don't get dumped on the taxpayers for a bailout. I think that uh, cues uh, Rachel up perfectly. Uh, Rachel, can you talk to us a little bit about what are those compensation problems that USPS is uh, facing, and uh, what are what are what 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 kind of uh, contributions are they required to make? We often hear criticisms that it's this so-called pre-funding requirement. Tell us a little bit more about it. So the postal service is unique. It's supposed to operate a bit like a business and be self-funded and yet it's also kind of semi-governmental and so a lot of its employee structure is the same structure that exists for other federal employees and also as Kevin mentioned it's highly unionized and so that's really driving a lot of the compensation structure. Um, overall the Postal Service employees are highly compensated. Their average compensation costs per employee are $97,000 and we're not talking about you know, everybody that needs to have a PhD to work for the USPS in general, the jobs there require, you know, a high school diploma, maybe an associate's degree. Um, and so this is a big gap in the compensation that's provided there. And even looking, we don't know exactly what FedEx and UPS is because it's hard to determine all the pension structure there. But if you just look at the percentage of USPS's costs that are for compensation, 75% of its costs are its employee compensation costs. And if you look at the revenues, it's actually 85 to 95% of its revenues are going towards its employees. Well, for FedEx, 36% of its costs are for compensation. So you can see how that's just such a big difference that is really driving the problems with USPS. So why doesn't it just adjust its compensation structure and have something that's more sustainable? Well, is a GRO report that came out this week said it really attributes it to two facts. Um, both there's a lot of congressional constraints and there are laws that say what these workers have to be paid and compensated and also just the highly unionized structure, the fact that 92% of USPS employees are unionized and so they, the union really is dictating what the pay is, what the benefits are and there's a lot of underfunding and a lot of it drives into just the benefit side, particularly the retiree health benefits as well as the pension benefits which have added about $120 billion in debt to USPS. Um, what's going on today is that as other federal agencies are supposed to contribute to a retirement system, USPS is supposed to do the same. So their employees are in the Federal Employees Retirement System or otherwise known as FERS. Um, they're entitled to the same employee pension benefits as federal employees, but they haven't actually made their contributions over the last couple of years um, while the, all, the other agencies are making those contributions. And so the implication on that is that it's potentially going to fall on other federal workers or on taxpayers to make up that lost money that USPS isn't putting in. And there was a Department of Justice memo that kind of clarified that because it was unclear whether or not employees of the Postal Service would be entitled to those benefits. But that memo said, yes, they are going to receive those benefits whether or not USPS contributes. And so we have seen in the past that Congress passed legislation to increase the amount that federal employees pay into their own retirement system. It went from 0.8% of their pay to 4.4%, and part of that was specifically to pay off other underfunding that existed before. And so we could see the same type of situation happening going forward is that Congress passes something and puts the burden on all other federal workers to cover the USPS shortfalls, or it could become a taxpayer bailout 
So really going forward, the only way that they can get after their compensation and create a more sustainable structure is to be freed from both these congressional constraints as well as the union factor. Um, and that's really the changes that I think we need to be considering right now. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I wanna quickly share our poll results. We had 24% uh, um, say that they think the Postal Service should be privatized, 53% saying it should be reformed, and 24%, same number as privatized, saying it should be bailed out. So uh, more than half think it should be reformed, and then we have uh, a tie when it comes to privatizing or bailing out. Um, I also want to encourage people to keep uh, submitting questions. I see a couple questions already coming in, so please keep those coming. I want to turn to Chris now and um, have you talk a little bit about what you see as the advantages and disadvantages of the USPS model that is um, the structure of the current postal system. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Romina, and thanks for hosting today. I'm delighted to be here with uh, Kevin and uh, Rachel. Um, so the, the USPS, the postal system that Americans grew up with, is no longer viable. Uh, other than packages, everything else the USPS uh, is doing is disappearing. Over 60% of the mail volume is advertising mail or junk mail. Uh, well, it's advertising is going online. The second biggest mail product uh, is uh, business statements and bank statements and that sort of stuff. That's all going online. So everything the USPS is doing other than packages is disappearing. So for that reason, the USPS is in a death spiral. Something needs to be uh, done. And I have argued that privatization is really the only viable solution here. So from the USPS perspective, uh, the advantages it has now is that it has a monopoly on first class mail and mailboxes. So it's able to earn some profits uh, that way, but those profits are uh, declining uh, again, because mail is disappearing. Uh, but then the, and it doesn't pay any taxes, whereas its package competitors do pay taxes. But there are many disadvantages to its current structure. Uh, the USPS has very little pricing flexibility like private businesses. It's not, Congress won't let it cut costs. It's not allowed to reduce the number of days of delivery. Uh, it has thousands of uh, retail locations that only a couple of people visit every day. So it's very inefficient. Um, the USPS doesn't have the money for new capital investment to buy new trucks, uh, to uh, invest in new technology like its competitors, like FedEx do, uh, and it has very bad governance. The Board of, the board of Governors of the USPS uh, for many years has been without a quorum, although recently it's got a quorum. So Congress imposes high costs on the USPS and doesn't give it the flexibility it needs to survive in the dynamic economy we live in. In general, you know, the government is not good at running businesses. We see this with Amtrak and other businesses the federal government tries to run, but it's particularly not good at running businesses that are in dynamic industries. And because of the rise of the internet, the postal industry has become very dynamic. So the government, uh, the government has become, uh, is really not good at running a business in a really fast moving, uh, and changing industry. And as I can get into on, uh, later in the session, is that the, the other postal systems abroad are running into these same problems with the rise of the uh, internet. And many of them have made the decision to, to overhaul their postal systems by opening them to competition and privatizing them. So I think that's the, the future here in the United States as well. Thank you, Chris. Um, I got one question, which I think is relevant to um, Rachel, what you just discussed. We have a question asking if the USPS was overfunding its pensions prior to stopping the payments. You want to take a quick uh, stab at that? Mm -hmm. No, it was just making its required contributions prior to that. And so it's usually a function of employees' salaries, and it depends on when they were hired. But in general, the agents, federal agencies have to contribute between about 11 and 13 percent of workers' salaries into this retirement system. But that's on top of a thrift savings plan. So in total, retirement benefits can make up about 18 percent of their workers' pay. Okay, let's dig into um, what Congress and the administration uh, can do now that we're in this situation. We have the bailout request. 
the president has his own ideas for um, how he thinks we should fix the Postal Service. What do you think is the best way forward? Uh, Chris, I want to start with you. Um, you've argued that privatization is really the only way. Can you elaborate on that view and how would that even happen? And I also want to uh, add a question from the audience. Uh, we have a question saying, um, as it relates to privatization, how would that benefit taxpayers given legacy costs? And uh, who would even be willing to buy USPS uh, if it's a, an entity running losses uh, at this point? Chris, floor is yours. So uh, as I said, other uh, postal systems abroad have faced the same problem of declining mail volumes uh, and the rise of package delivery and the rise of the internet. And uh, in Europe, the solution that they've come to is opening up postal systems to competition. So in Euro every European country now must open its postal system to competition. And many countries in Europe have privatized their systems. So some countries like Germany, the UK and Netherlands uh, have fully privatized their systems, meaning that they've turned them into publicly traded corporations where most of the shares are owned by uh, uh, private shareholders. Some countries uh, like Belgium and Italy and Austria have partly privatized their systems, meaning they've turned them into publicly traded corporations while the government still owns the majority of shares. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other countries that um, still have a government system, but they've opened them to competition. So in Sweden, for example, uh, Post Nord continues to be the, uh, the government company, uh, but uh, there's an, uh, an upstart company called City Mail that's an entrepreneurial postal company. Uh, it delivers three days a week to two thirds of the addresses in Sweden, and it competes against the government system. So all over Europe, uh, you see these changes and there's, there's a lot of cost cutting going on. Um, uh, so for example, uh, many European countries have, have closed virtually all of their locations. The locations have moved uh, to grocery stores. And as it turns out, a lot of consumers in Europe have found that to be actually more convenient than having a separate uh, office locations for post offices. They can do their postal business at their local grocery store. So some of these changes are obvious and any private business would be making some of these cost cutting uh, changes. So uh, we've also seen a lot of other countries uh, reduce the number of days of delivery. Congress requires six day delivery in the United States. That makes absolutely no sense anymore. The, uh, the demand for uh, mail has plunged, and usually when the demand for a product falls, then uh, businesses reduce the supply of it. But, uh, uh, and so, for example, you know, uh, New Zealand, the New Zealand government uh, mail corporation has moved to three day a week delivery in cities. Uh, we're still at six days a week delivery. So uh, the government, Congress is imposing these additional costs on the USPS and preventing, preventing it from making these sort of sensible business changes to allow it to survive. So the reason why privatization makes sense is twofold very quickly. One, because the demand for the product has plunged and the USPS needs the flexibility uh, to move into new products and to cut costs. And secondly, because the, uh, the rising new product that the USPS uh, is, is dealing in is packages. And there it competes with private companies, FedEx and UPS but we need a level playing field for uh, package competition. And the only way you can do that is to move the USPS to the private sector, uh, get it to pay taxes like its private competitors, remove its monopoly privileges, and then we can have an open uh, playing field uh, competition in packages. So that's why privatization makes sense. Thank you, Chris. Um, Kevin. Um, I read a piece of yours in Politico where you've argued that USPS is too important to let it fail. Why do you think that is true and uh, how, how should Congress and the president proceed in light of the current losses that the service is running? Sure, yeah, no, uh, the Postal Service is um, embedded in so many aspects of uh, American life. Uh, take jury summons. Jury summons come through the mail. You know, you renew your your automobile's uh, registration sticker that comes through the mail. In 2016, more than 20 million people uh, voted through the mail. And this year, thanks to COVID, many more people are going to vote through the mail. 
Additionally, the private shipping companies frequently have deals with the Postal Service where they pay the Postal Service to carry a parcel the final mile. So it's deeply entangled in our system. And I, I took that as a premise for the piece I wrote in Politico about how to save the Postal Service. And I also had two other premises. Uh, one is that the Postal Service you know, may run out of cash within the next six to 12 months, depending on how bad demand falls during the COVID period. And second, um, we have a lot of Democratic senators and representatives, and those numbers could possibly get higher after November. Uh, so any plan to save the Postal Service is going to have to cut muster with them. So what I advanced was a proposal that tried to attack the revenue side, um, the debt obligation issues, uh, but also the cost side. Um, I'm absolutely with Chris. I think that the annual mandate that the Postal Service deliver paper mail six days a week is antiquated. Um, I also think that the Postal Service does need additional freedom to raise prices, both for paper mail and for parcels. Um, additionally, I think that when your unions are collectively bargaining with the Postal Service over compensation, uh, I think if it goes to um, mediation, uh, decision making by one of the federal mediators, then the mediator needs to consider the financial well being of the Postal Service when rendering a decision. I mean, you can't just keep upping compensation year after year if the, if the entity's revenues are going down. That's a formula for death. Um, so in my Twitter feed, I've got the rest of my plan put out there. It's got about seven separate points. Um, but, you know, we got to figure out something and we got to figure out something soon because the trend lines are going in the wrong directions. Costs are going up, according to the most recent financial filing, uh, and revenues are not going up. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, Rachel, with uh, compensation costs and uh, the benefits that the Postal Service offers its workers being such a huge driver of Postal Service costs and Congress really um, having blocked the Postal Service from managing itself like uh, a real business that can control its compensation costs, what are some um, reforms that Congress could make to Postal Service worker compensation short of um, setting them free and letting them determine their own compensation. How could they reform some of those um, costs? Mm -hmm. And there's actually a lot that can be done even if um, the Postal Service does stay within the federal government as an entity. As I said, the biggest costs are coming from those retirement benefits, the pension plan and the retiree health benefits. And so there's a way that we can give those workers everything that they have earned to date, but then shift things going forward. And so I think the biggest shift needs to be getting out of a defined, con a defined benefit plan that's this pension and retirement and shifting more of it into the defined contribution, which is like a 401k. Um, on the federal government side, that's called the thrift savings plan. It's something that all these workers already have. And so it's just a movement, transferring more of what's in the DB plan, the pension into the TSP, the 401k plan. And there's a pretty simple way that you can do that. We've proposed um, this for all federal employees. You would grandfather for those who have been in the system a really long time. The new employees and those who have only been there a few years would just get a higher contribution to their 401k and then everybody in between would have a choice. You keep everything that you've already earned and you can choose to stay in that system but you might need to pay a little more and maybe you would retire a year or two later. Um, you can freeze that plan and then shift everything over to the new 401k or the existing 401k with higher contributions or it's something that might be interesting to workers is to have a buyout of your pension benefit and have it all go into your 401k to have a higher amount there and something that's more transferable. This would be particularly beneficial to people who don't see themselves staying with the USPS for their entire career. Um, the other big part is of course the health benefits. And I think that the simplest thing to do, um, it won't take effect, you know, won't have a lot out of realization and savings for a longer time, but is to end the retiree health benefits for new workers. On the USPS side, this would address their inability to fund those benefits today. Um, and we really would give those workers time to prepare. If you're 20 years old and starting out as a postal worker, you know, you have time to know that you're not going to have those retiree health benefits and there might be something else at that time. And it's just not something that the private sector is providing anymore. 
Um, another proposal that's out there is to allow the USPS to invest at least a portion of what it puts into its retiree health benefits in indexed funds so that they can earn higher returns. And I think that absolutely makes sense because if you look at these finalized values when companies or the government are paying out their benefits, 60% of the value that's there in those accounts has come from investment returns over time. And today we're requiring USPS to put this money into the fund and all it invests in is treasuries that earn a paltry rate of return. So this is another proposal that would allow them to actually be able to have to put less in and still provide the same type of benefit. And that is HR 2553, the Postal Service Financial Improvement Act. Um, but there's other parts of compensation that also need to be tied in here. You know, federal employees and USPS workers receive a lot more paid time off per year you know, 43 days um, after having just three years of service. That includes your holidays, your sick days, your vacation. The private sector is significantly lower. The private sector is shifting to paid time off, um, you know, so that you have one pool that you use all of it from. And then also just bringing the pay in line with the private sector as well. And that's not just having pay cuts, it's also providing opportunities and different pathways for people to earn more, to have pay um, performance based on pay, and to have bonuses and other things, choices that those workers would be able to make in terms of their compensation. Thank you, Rachel. I want to take a, a couple more questions here from the audience. I have several questions about post offices that I want to uh, put together. One of them is um, what's preventing the Postal Service from closing post offices that don't see a lot of foot traffic? And uh, another related one is what if we turn post offices into um, banks, banking locations? What if the post office also offered banking services? Would that um, help its uh, bottom line? Who would like to take that? Okay, let's start with uh, Chris and go to Kevin. So the U.S. Uh, Postal Service has over 30,000 uh, office locations now. Uh, about over a third of them, according to the GAO, uh, don't earn a profit, meaning they lose money. And in fact, the USPS itself a few years ago calculated that uh, off the top of my head, there's something like 4,000 locations that only have about three customers a day. So there's a lot of small towns in America there that they have an old fashioned sort of standalone postal postal uh, location and its own building, right? You know, with electricity and utility costs and all that and employee costs, you only get a few customers a day. That makes absolutely no sense. Those sorts of post offices ought to be closed. The real estate ought to be sold to pay down some of this debt. And the post office, uh, the retail location ought to be moved to some existing business like a like a grocery store that would add convenience to people uh, living in rural uh, locations. So uh, that's that's uh, I think what we need we need to do there. I mean I think that one of the previous questions asked so how would you actually go about privatizing? And the answer is that you know you look at how the Royal Mail was privatized in Britain. You uh, you um, uh, you uh, convert the USPS into a publicly traded corporation, and then you sell chunks of shares to the public. Uh, you give postal employees who, who are going to be concerned about that sort of a change, you give them a discount on uh, the USPS shares, and that gives them a, uh, an interest in the uh, success of the uh, a business. Uh, you could even uh, 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 require this new private entity to have a, a, a universal service uh, requirement like they do in other countries. Uh, th the point, though, would be to create, uh, uh, give the USPS flexibility and to put it on a level playing field uh, with some of its competitor companies in the package industry. So that's, that's the future, uh, I think. But retail locations, it doesn't make any sense to have 30,000 uh, retail locations uh, these days. It's very costly, it's bad for the environment. It doesn't make any sense. And I would just add to that, I think a lot of those decisions, it's hard if there's a proposal to close a certain number of post offices and then politics gets involved and the local congresswoman or congressman says, no, you can't close this one. It's not like an actual private sector business that is free to make the decisions and implement them. It all has to filter through Congress. Yeah, it's true. Political resistance definitely plays a part. So if you look at the number of post offices over the last 20 years, it has gone down, but it's not gone down nearly as much as you would expect in light of the uh, insufficient demand. In some cases, post offices are, 
difficult to close just because they are also a distribution node. Um, they're not just doing retail service there, but you know they're having big honking trucks pull up there, and postal carriers will will come up there, and so they need space in order to be able to do that sort of handoff of the mail. Uh, another thing that has prevented the closure of post offices has been union control of the shop floor. We had an instance in the last five years where the Postal Service tried to do something kind of clever. It decided that it was going to have a partnership with Staples to put in postal counters there. And the idea would be kind of similar to the FedEx Kinko's model. You go in there, you print something out, you put it in a shipping tube, and they can send it out to the US Postal for you. Unions basically said, you are stealing our work. We refuse to go along with this unless you let postal workers go into Staples and do the work, which of course was a non-starter um, and kind of to some degree defeats the cost saving purposes, uh, particularly for low volume locations. Uh, and ultimately it was killed off. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's another reason. Now, as far as postal banking goes, I looked into the case for postal banking a few years ago. It's an idea that's been around forever. And when I looked at the FDIC data on the um, so-called unbanked, um, there's not really a whole lot of demand there that is not being met by the private sector. And the Postal Service does not have existing infrastructure to run a bank. Indeed, when the Inspector General of the Postal Service, who actually liked the idea of postal banking, looked into it, they basically said Postal Service, in order to pull off banking, would have to outsource everything, which, again, if the private sector can already do it, why would you do that sort of thing? It doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mobile banking, I think, has basically made um, the idea that you need to turn post offices into uh, little banks of their own uh, obsolete. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I don't remember the last time I walked into an actual post uh, bank location now doing even my checks uh, via my cell phone. Uh, Chris, I have a couple of questions for you from several um, participants that I'm going to tie together and they pretty much all relate to um, how can privatization uh, work uh, in terms of the United States, given that we're a vastly bigger country. Um, we have rural areas that are harder to reach. Isn't one of the benefits of the Postal Service as a government entity that they go everywhere and um, serve the entire country? And if we uh, privatize it, wouldn't that open USPS up to competition and certain other companies would cherry pick uh, routes that are more profitable, leaving um, the United States Postal Service with unprofitable routes? I think with privatization, you know, we'd have three big companies, FedEx, UPS, and uh, the Postal Service, and maybe other companies down the road that uh, compete across a broad spectrum uh, of uh, services, you know, packages and uh, mail. I think it's reasonable under privatization for, the, for Congress to, say, require uh, some sort of a minimum universal service uh, obligation, let's say, delivering to every address in America three days a week. Um, and so you might get a situation down the road where, uh, say, uh, you know, the USPS or the UPS and FedEx continue to use USPS to deliver to some of those rural addresses that they that they don't want to uh, deliver to. And so that would be, you know, a reasonable sort of market uh, solution. So uh, I don't I don't see uh, anything anything that people rely on the USPS for today. You could, you know, that that would continue to be the case in uh, in a privatized world. The issue of rural post offices was was also an issue in England and other countries uh, that privatized their systems, and they had solved the problem. European countries have universal service obligations for their main postal carriers, but one of the differences is is that they, they, these universal service obligations are less stringent. Uh, and expansive uh, than the U.S. Uh, universal service obligation, which, by the way, is not a, there, there is no particular statute that uh, defines the universal service obligation of the U.S. Postal Service. It's in a bunch of different laws and, and sort of traditions, um, but certainly six-day delivery is one of those current uh, st uh, statutory requirements that doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's, it's, as we discussed, it's also very difficult for the USPS to close 
of postal locations because of congressional uh, resistance. So I, I think we need to liberalize those stringent requirements and have some sort of a you know a, a reasonable middle of the uh, middle way of uh, to, uh, to provide universal service at reasonable prices for all Americans. Uh, Rachel, we have another question about the compensation reforms that you talked about. Is that something that um, the U.S. Postal Service could do on its own, or do they need Congress to change the law? What's uh, what's the situation? Yes, they cannot do any of this on their own. They need um, changes from Congress, and also there would be negotiations with the union involved. I'm getting lots of questions. This is very exciting. Um, another one having to do with uh, delivery is, uh, what do the panelists think about digital mailbox service providers? Um, and I just want to mention that um, Yesterday, as I went on Netflix, I saw um, Jerry Seinfeld has a new uh, episode called 23 Hours, and I read that he makes fun of the Postal Service, and I found that he, he did something similar in 2012 where um, he said that, uh, how do you expect them to be profitable when they're operating based on a business model from 300 years ago? And, uh, and also made the point that if they want to be useful to Americans, instead of delivering junk mail six days a week, how about you open our letters, scan them in and email them to us. <laughs> so what about digital mail services? What do you all think? Who wants that to take is, that? I mean, just quickly, that is a service provided by some of the European uh, postal uh, carriers now. You can have your mail stopped at the your local uh, uh, post, uh, post office uh, center. They scan it and email it to you. So there's changes like that that are actually make sense economically. They also make sense environmentally. As I said, over 60% of the mail delivered to uh, your door now is junk mail. Uh, that makes no sense economically or environmentally. Americans don't want that junk. Advertising can move online and will move online. So uh, I think that there's a lot of solutions here that make sense from a lot of different angles. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, perhaps 10 years ago, there was a private sector company, a startup that created just that sort of service. And in order to do that, they, you know, you as a mail customer not only had to sign up for that service, but then you had to fill out a form at the postal service, which basically allows a third party to be authorized to open your mail, because a lot of mail is sealed against inspection. Um, that business got up and running, and then the postal service basically started pulling its permissions for it to open mail and the business died. Um, some years after that, the Postal Service started launching their own version of it, um, but I confess that I, to date, have not met anybody who's using it. Um, but I certainly would like to see, that's the sort of idea where the Postal Service, that platform, can be opened up to the private sector and you could have companies out there who are doing just, just that sort of thing. Um, opening people's mail, scanning it for them, providing all sorts of other related services, that would be great. To, to add one thing uh, on there, Romina, is, is to, this is one way to think about the postal system. It has a monopoly on first class mail and, and mailboxes, but that, but that um, system is really out of step with most everything else we do in the American economy. We have antitrust laws to encourage competition in just about every other industry. And in this one industry, for some reason, we've decided to exclude entrepreneurs. But as Kevin was discussing, if you open this up, and allowed entrepreneurs to come into the postal space here, there would be a lot of innovative solutions here that the US Postal Service isn't thinking of and isn't executing very well. So that one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons we want to go to privatization and competition is not just for, you know, uh, uh, you know, costs and labor unions and that, that those sorts of reasons, but also to allow entrepreneurs to come in and discover new ways uh, of uh, serving uh, people in the in this of uh, the postal industry that government bureaucrats have not thought of. So entrepreneurship is one is one way to think about uh, the future of the postal system. Chris is quite right about the mailbox. I mean, the mailbox we have today is not the mailbox we need. I mean, it's basically a letterbox. And as we know, more and more of what we're getting is in the form of parcels. 
And we frequently don't know who is bringing that parcel to our front door. UPS may carry it part way and then hand it off to the Postal Service. It may go from FedEx over to laser ship. We need a box that everybody can access and a box that's big enough to hold parcels and be secure so people aren't swiping our packages off of our front porch and they're not getting rained on and all that sort of stuff. But instead, we're locked into this antiquated system of letter boxes, which are becoming decreasingly useless. They sure do a great job of uh, capturing all my junk mail. <laughs> Um, Kevin, I have a question, uh, another question for you, and this has to do with um, rate setting. And this is also a question from um, our audience today. Um, you mentioned earlier that perhaps they should be raising rates on, on, on certain services. The president certainly has talked a lot about that and recently said that he would not sign um, any aid for USPS unless uh, they significantly raise the rates they're charging Amazon. Um, the question from our audience is, um, how can USPS actually raise its rate? Isn't that done by the Postal Regulatory Commission? And isn't one of the problems that they hold public hearings and allow testimony by com competitors? What should be done with the Postal Regulatory Commission and rate setting so that can reflect um, the Postal Service operation costs? Good question uh, and a complicated one. I'll try to be quick and straightforward as I can. Um, the 2006 law basically cleaved mail into two classes, monopoly mail and competitive mail. For monopoly mail, the Postal Service can only raise the rates on monopoly mail uh, at the rate of the CPI. So each year, at the end of the year, they put in a request to the PRC and they say, let's raise first class whatever percent and all that sort of thing. Competitive products, Postal Service basically has the freedom to raise those prices as it sees fit. Uh, and the PRC kind of gives a cursory review to make sure that the that the rates are not uh, discriminatory or troubled in certain ways. And so what we've seen is that you know prices have gone up a little bit with the CPI for the monopoly stuff. Uh, the competitive products has been a much more mixed bag, but they've seen some significant increases. Um, the bigger problem is that the law that we got in 2006. Um, basically allows the Postal Service to not attribute a significant amount of their operating costs. Uh, last time I looked at it, of their $75 billion in operating costs, something like $35 billion of it was not attributed to a particular product or service, which makes pricing it accurately very difficult. And we know that the mail mix is changing. So, you know, paper mail is going down, parcels are going up. So logically, you would think parcel prices would have to go up significantly to bear more of those costs. Uh, but we've only seen a little bit of that. And that's the thing that the president has been banging on quite a bit. I have a two-pronged question, which I think uh, might be for Rachel and uh, uh, anybody else. And that that has to do with if we tried to privatize the Postal Service, would that be difficult to do given the legacy costs of their unfunded uh, pension and health, uh, retiree health obligations? Um, isn't that a huge impediment to privatization? Who would want to take over those costs? What could be done about that? And then a related question, does the value of the real estate owned by the USPS uh, potentially offer a solution to addressing those legacy costs, what else could be done with um, the assets that USPS uh, has? Yeah, so there are some transition costs, but USPS has been contributing to its pension system. So it's been paying into that FERS retirement system that's there. And so on the pension side, there's not really much cost, especially based on the fact that DOJ has already said everything that workers have earned, they will receive. And so you could pretty quickly shift that pension system. Um, on the retiree health costs, they haven't been paying in for the past couple of years, so there are some unfunded obligations there. But you could make those up. You could also make reforms to what workers are going to receive in retirement as well. And so I don't think that transition costs should be an impediment to moving towards privatization or just towards freeing up the Postal Service to make changes on those fronts. And I'll ask um, Kevin or Chris if they have any thoughts more on the, you know, the ownership of their properties. Yeah, so I think we face two choices here. If we don't do any reforms, taxpayers uh, could be out tens and tens of billions of dollars down the road, and this will be a never-ending drain on taxpayers unless we make some major structural reforms. 
And the decision a bunch of other countries have made, like Britain when they privatized the Royal Mail, was that the taxpayer would take a short-term hit. They would take over uh, some of the unfunded retirement costs of the government system, uh, and then the new system would be free of those costs and then could compete fairly with private uh, mail carriers. And I think that's the decision we would we could make here, is that you know the taxpayer takes a short-term hit and takes over some of the debt and unfunded costs, but then we allow USPS to compete fairly with uh, private businesses. On the issue of postal service assets, the, the USPS has, does have a lot of assets. Uh, there, it does have over 30,000 locations, although it's true that a lot of those locations are, uh, are leased, they're not owned. However, so if you, if you look on USPS uh, financial statements, you'll find that liabilities far outweigh assets. However, those assets are at what economists or accountants call historical costs. We don't know how much those assets would actually um, sell for in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a free market, maybe many times more than the historical cost of those assets on the, on the balance sheet. And curiously, this is an interesting issue across all the federal government. People will often email me and say, Chris, why don't we sell off this or that uh, federal government asset? The federal government owns about 300,000 or so different buildings and structures, a lot of which we could sell. The government has really no idea what the market value of most of its assets uh, are. And that's true, again, for the USPS assets. So as we move toward privatization, which I think we're going to go in that direction uh, in coming years, um, uh, and indeed, I'm pretty sure that that's where we're going to be going. Uh, the, the federal the, the federal government could, could do everyone a favor by trying to uh, market value uh, the the uh, the, ten, the the thousands of, of assets and and building locations that the USPS uh, owns uh, to see how much we could get in a privatization uh, or sale uh, in an IPO. Uh, Kevin, another question for you, and then I'm going to launch one more poll to see if anybody changed their mind about whether the USPS should be reformed, privatized, or bailed out. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you all uh, to wrap us up with just uh, one key takeaway. Uh, but Kevin, the last question for you is, uh, we in, in the past couple of weeks, we've seen lots of media reports saying that USPS could possibly have to shut down over the summer or possibly by September. Um, today, we got uh, different financial reporting. It appears that they have at least enough money to last another year. Uh, what are we supposed to believe? Why is it so difficult to figure out what the real financial situation of USPS is? Yes, why, why indeed? Um, yeah, we all probably saw the newspapers uh, about a month ago where this figure of, you know, volume revenue dropping off 30%. You know, there was talk in the air of the Postal Service shutting down in June, and then it was said, well, it'll probably be September. Um, the Postal Service itself was involved in some of these conversations that, that media then subsequently reported on. Yeah, I, I, as somebody who watches the Postal Service and is, you know, trying to help uh, Congress fix the Postal Service. I've been quite frustrated by the failure to be more forthcoming about where mail volume and revenues are and to put data out there that, you know, smart people can and everybody can look at and try to figure out, like, how much is COVID really affecting their financial health? Um, but instead, that was not what we got. Instead, what we got was numbers leaking out through the media um, and subsequent, you know, approaches by the Postal Service to members of Congress to ask for significant bailouts. The last one, I think, was more than $80 billion, uh, which was just such an obvious non-starter. Um, and no reforms were actually put with those demands for money. It was just give us a lot of money uh, and a lot of relief. Uh, yeah, it's an unfortunate situation, and I'm glad they've released a, a financial statement today, which is helpful, but I, uh, I'm going to be very interested to see what sort of data they released to Senator Ron Johnson, who has demanded that Postal Service provide every week or two an update on finances and revenue. That way we can get a better real-time sense of where the agency is. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I'm going to go ahead and launch this um, second poll for everyone. Uh, please select uh, 
and it, you're, you can select the same answer you had before or feel free to select a new one should the postal service be privatized, reformed, or bailed out. And while this is, while this is going on and our panelists prepare to leave us with their uh, final concluding thought, I just also wanted to highlight that at the Heritage Foundation, we published a new report just this morning. It argues that um, Congress should set the Postal Service free so it can operate competitively and sustainably instead of bailing it out. And uh, while we believe that setting the Postal Service free so that it could be spun off as a private entity is the best solution in the long run to allow it to be competitive and operate sustainably and profitably, um, in the short term, it doesn't mean that the only option is a bailout. Rather, um, any aid that Congress might provide uh, on the road to privatization uh, should absolutely must be contingent on reforms. Uh, otherwise, uh, one bailout will only beget more bailouts. And, and um, looks like uh, most people have answered. Now we're starting to slow down. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And um, I'll share it after we hear your uh, concluding uh, thoughts. Um, what uh, would you like to leave our panelists with today? We'll start with Rachel. I would just say that if USPS is going to remain viable, it needs flexibility. It can't rely on Congress and unions to be in charge of its operations. And if we look at the current situation going on right now with COVID-19 and how companies are responding and they might be changing, not making a retirement contribution, altering their employee shifts, all these things require flexibility. We look at last year, USPS's compensation costs were 94% of its revenues. If they've suffered a 30% revenue loss, it's very clear that they cannot be viable if they aren't allowed to be flexible on those compensation costs. Kevin, you're next, and then Chris. Yeah, um, we all need to recognize that it would be a catastrophe if the Postal Service ran out of cash and just didn't open one day. Um, it would be bad for seniors and others who rely on the Postal Service to get them their prescription drugs. It'd be bad for those of us who vote by mail. It'd be bad for small business and big business alike. Um, it's, a, it's a situation that we all should want to avoid, and I would hope realization of that would get folks to kind of come forth and to work together to cut a deal, uh, to deal with this problem and deal with it sooner rather than later. Uh, I think it'd be a terrible thing if the politicians decided to wait until after the November election to tackle this problem. And like I said, there's a cost side problem, a revenue problem, and there's a debt and obligation problem. And all three of those got to be tackled if this thing is going to be viable. Chris, it's you. You're next. Yeah, you know, if you're a USPS supporter, even if you're a union member who's working for the USPS, uh, you should be in favor of privatization because I really believe that the only way this entity will survive, and I think it should survive for some of the reasons uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, there's a generational thing going on here. Young people don't use mail. They do their banking online. They communicate online. Uh, the first class mail volume has fallen about 50% since uh, uh, 2001, and, and and I think it'll probably continue to plunge. Uh, the current crisis is showing that. Uh, advertising moving online. Uh, the USPS is being decimated because of changing consumer demands. The only way it can survive, uh, I believe, is to have the flexibility of privatization to get the politicians in Washington out of the micromanagement of this business. It needs flexibility to survive. The other uh, issue is that as the USPS gets more into package delivery. These issues that President Trump has raised about competition with FedEx and UPS are not going away. Uh, the USPS pays no taxes. FedEx pays about $2 billion a year in taxes. There's an unfair uh, playing field here. And the more the USPS gets into package delivery, the more that's going to become uh, an issue. So, you know, my closing thought is this, is that the USPS has been through this uh, long evolution before 1970. It was a uh, sort of a line department of the federal government. Congress gave it more independence in 1970 legislation. 
And then in 1979, a lot of people don't uh, 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 realize this, that the USPS, uh, they used to have a monopoly over uh, what is now called express mail or what, what FedEx's main business is, is delivering these uh, urgent uh, overnight packages. The USPS used to have a monopoly on that, but it relaxed that monopoly and that led to the, the rise of this massive industry that FedEx and UPS operate in now, which is express delivery. So there has been this liberalization over the decades, and the next step along the way here, uh, in my view, is full privatization. Uh, privatization is already happening to some extent anyway. The USPS is contracting out a lot of its uh, transportation services and the like, uh, but it's still sort of a, that you know has a government shell around it, and I think that's creating a lot of inefficiency. Uh, Europe has shown the way here. I think we need to go to full privatization and competition. Uh, again, thanks a lot for holding the seminar today, uh, Romina. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I want to share this, uh, this exit poll. Um, I would say that uh, this is a success. We had, uh, we had roughly a quarter of people previously saying that USPS should be bailed out. And that number has dropped significantly. We now have an even tie between um, privatizing USPS or reforming it. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we, we got the points across to our audience here today. And I want to thank um, all of my, my panelists, Chris, Kevin, Rachel. Thank you so much for um, joining us uh, today. We just put up a slide so people can find you. Uh, email you or follow you on Twitter. Some people asked, uh, what's Kevin's Twitter? I think they want to go look at that thread that you mentioned, at Kevin Kosar. My Twitter is at Romina Bacha. And uh, Chris Edwards also has a Twitter. Uh, Chris, you want to share it? Uh, the email is the best way to reach me. Okay, or you can just very search good. For Cato, Cato, Chris Edwards. Great. And uh, for all of our panelists, again, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, go check out the great work that um, all of these uh, experts have written uh, at their respective organizations. Visit uh, Cato.org and uh, is it rstreet.org as well? rstreet.org and heritage.org. Um, and, uh, and we will be sending an email uh, shortly with uh, the video and you can also find it on heritage.org afterwards and share it with other people who might be interested in this conversation. Thanks again and uh, have a great weekend, everybody.